Though, Ali, the city is having trouble cracking down on these stores. That's right. Make, take this location, for example. They were raided on Monday. A padlock was put on the door, which was clipped the next day. This location of cafe reopened. Then they got raided again. Police put up a steel door. So today they cracked a window and cafe workers were back inside. I'm told that of the 21 illegal dispensaries that the city is investigating, cafe is by far the most relentless. While workers huddle inside, customers aren't exactly getting turned away. They can help themselves to a cookie and a business card with directions to either of the two out of four locations that are still open, like the one on St. Clair and Cafe is actually offering a shuttle service to take people from the shutdown location at City Place to this one here on Harvard. There are still plenty of people picking up today. Meanwhile, the cafe location here on Bloor Street has been closed. The notice wasn't enough. The padlock wasn't enough. They too have a steel door and Toronto Hydro is here to cut the power. It's the city's job to crack down on these dispensaries and they are now playing the same game of whack-a-mole that the police were in the pre-legalization days. Their stores are still open and operating now. It's just a matter of time before we get to them. The city place location today where there was a steel door and I understand that that's a method of barring entry but people were coming in and out of that. We're aware that they also at that location have broken in once again so we're going to be addressing and dealing with that issue as well. Does that result in, in more charges? We're looking at all possible um, charges we can lay against the parties that we hold responsible as well as the landlords. In that case, Fort York Boulevard is a, as I understand it, a part of a condominium corporation. So the board of directors for the condominium corporation, if they're not exercising their due diligence to stop this illegal operation, they themselves can face charges. Like a $1 million fine. I guess it just sort of speaks to the money that they're making. The money they're making and also possibly they're hedging their bets and thinking that perhaps the financial penalties will not amount to what's possible. But we don't know until it gets in front of a, an actual justice of the peace in the courts and they're found guilty and then see what the penalties are that are in fact levied. As well as for individuals, it can include jail time. With the raids continuing, the people who are inside the store purchasing, are they going to get in trouble? No, in fairness, customers, there is confusion. They don't understand perhaps that in, in Ontario in particular, only specific licensed stores and they need to be looking for the provincial seal on the stores like the Honey Pot has that clearly says that they are in fact a legal store. Now, obviously not everybody got the message that this store is closed. There are still people here uh, asking about uh, what happened and they're just being diverted to the other cafe locations that are open. Uh, bylaw officers just left the premises and they secured uh, the window that was broken at least. Now, these dispensaries are thriving right now because the demand is still there. Still, only two of Toronto's five legal dispensaries are actually open. So the idea there um, is that the more legal shops open, uh, the more of these illegal ones will be squeezed out. We'll see, Mike. We'll see what effect that has. Thanks a lot, Ali. Well, coming up, it has been exactly six months since cannabis was legalized. It was supposed to bring in lots of green for cities. But is that really what's happening? Some mayors say provinces aren't passing it on claim, well, we don't know what the costs are, so we can't give up any of the excise tax to the cities because we don't know what our costs are. Well, here's the thing. I know what my costs are. They're really high. Well, every day, hundreds of pregnant women and new moms turn to the Mother Risk Helpline for answers to their health questions, but now they'll have to get that information somewhere else, and that's left some wondering where they'll turn. Mukta Gabrasalasa has more. So fun. Doing everything they can to protect their little ones, these moms have turned to mother risk several times. I've had to be on medication before where various doctors have said, it's okay, but check mother risk. I was in Ireland and I got a lung infection and I had to take some antibiotics and I had no idea if it was going to, be, and the doctor didn't know if I was able to take it and breastfeed. So I was able to call mother risk and find out. After 35 years, Sick Kid says mother risk is no more. 
for me, it's doctors are relying on it. Pharmacists are relying on it, saying like, if you have any questions, go ahead and call Mother Risk. So if you don't have that source anymore to go ahead and call someone, I mean, who are they going to look to to know if something is 100% okay for pregnancies? Things change all the time. Dr. Howard Berger, an authority on fetal medicine, shares their concerns. And, um, might increase anxiety, might lead to wrong decisions uh, regarding uh, the use of medications in pregnancy. The statement from SickKids suggests raising private money for the program proved to be a problem, dating back to the mother risk lab scandal. In 2015, the lab run by Dr. Gideon Corin was closed after drug and alcohol tests were found to be unreliable, affecting more than 1,000 child protection and criminal cases. SickKids said over the last three years, those grants and donations have been reduced to zero. The hospital is now referring people to an American program, mother to baby. We are certainly not staffed uh, in the U.S. to take on uh, 200 calls a day uh, instantaneously. We are uh, discussing this very actively right now about how we might respond uh, in the interim while, while there is a void. That's just not good enough for these moms. I don't know, I'm really conflicted. Um, in, in America, they have a lot of things that are different from our, our own. So the fact that, you know, they might be giving me the okay on something that is FDA approved, but may not be Health Canada approved. So is there gonna be any kind of regulation to make sure that that's happening? While the helplines are off the hook, the mother risk clinic is still seeing patients referred to them by doctors. Magda Gebrecht-Selassie, CBC News, Toronto. We have 300 people who have been access to board, surplus to board, and what that means is that there is nowhere for us in September. She is one of some 300 teachers in Peel Region who won't have a permanent job next school year, despite the Ford government saying no teachers will lose their jobs. Coming up a little later in the show, more of my conversation with this teacher and how the province is responding today. Game four is almost here. It hits the scene at Maple Leaf Square as Leaf fans are filtering in. We're about an hour away from puck drop. Toronto up two games to one over the Boston Bruins. A win tonight would go a long way to easing the minds of Here, some of the these ball, fans. Joe, you Greg Ross spoke to some of those fans. He joins us live from Maple Leaf Square. Greg, a lot of Leafs faithful are hoping Toronto can keep up the momentum tonight. Yeah, they certainly are. And I'll tell you, Mike, right now, this is the place to be. It is absolutely packed here in Maple Leaf Square. These fans are primed and ready to go. A lot of excitement here. But the place to be earlier today was a public school in New North York, where the entire school got involved with the playoff spirit, cheering on our two playoff teams. A pep rally for Toronto sports teams at Summit Heights Public School. Kids of all different ages showing their support. How old are you now? Five. I'm, I'm, I'm five and a half. But none old enough to remember the last time the Leafs won a playoff series back in 2004, let alone the last time they won a Stanley Cup. Gus Vietstra was born in 2010. I think 15 years ago we were probably just spurs of thought in our parents' minds, just waiting to happen. <laughs> okay. But many are old enough to remember the sting of watching the Leafs lose to Boston in the first round last year. Beechtra says this time around the Leafs will get their revenge. The Leafs only need a few slap shots and the Bruins will probably be crying on their knees begging for mercy. Julian Salvaggio doesn't think it's going to be quite that easy. What do you think is going to happen in game four tonight? I think it's going to be a close game because the Bruins are tough on us, but I think we can beat them. Many of these kids have been granted special permission to stay up past their bedtime. Are you going to stay up and watch the game tonight? Yes, for sure, definitely. You don't have to go to bed before the end of the game? No. Are you sure? Yes. Chelsea Freeman is looking forward to watching her favorite player with her favorite person. What do you like about John Tavares? I just... That my he dad. scores a lot of goals? And my dad likes him also a lot. Whether they're watching or not, they all seem pretty confident about how it will end. Who's going to win the game tonight? Please! I'll tell you, all of the fans here are going to be staying up late tonight to watch the end of this one. They are hoping that the Leafs can pull off another victory like they did in game three. They would take a commanding three games to one lead if they can do that. And they would head to Boston 
for game five with a chance to clinch this series. And I bet you if we talk to a lot of these fans before this series start, they would be surprised that the Leafs would be ahead this early in the series with a chance to move on like they are. But here we go. The Leafs looking very good against the Bruins in game three. Mike Babcock say they need to come with that same kind of pressure in game four, Mike. Absolutely. Look forward to it tonight. Thanks, Greg. So Kala joins us now. We've been asking this every night. Just uh, what's going to be like for those fans gathering outside of the, the arena tonight? Yeah, Mike. Well, they're going to see changing conditions actually over the course of this game while they're watching. I don't know if they're even going to care, but there may be some light rain showers pushing in. So umbrellas could be in order. Let me just show you how it goes throughout the evening. So 7 p.m. We do have some of that high thin cloud that's going to be thickening up a little bit. The temperature coming down just a little bit. 11 degrees still really pleasant. But as we get between 7 and 9, some showers likely light but quite possible those will move in and seeing that into 11 as well. So some changes with the temperature coming down, but we could see some light wet conditions as well. If you look at the radar right now, you're probably saying, what are you talking about? Let me broaden the perspective and give you an idea. We've got a warm front on the way and what's happening is that it extends here towards Lake Erie and as it's pushing towards us, we're seeing some of these rain showers starting to fill in a little bit and you can see all the lightning back towards the west of us too. So an odd and Embedded thunderstorm tonight possible a greater chance though as this swings through tomorrow it's also going to be picking our temperature up tomorrow as it comes through and what we're going to see is the temperature spiking to close to 20 degrees and then some rain and likely some thunderstorms roll through tomorrow afternoon there's a dry slot in between there I want you to enjoy that because we will get into some heavier rains and in fact a rainfall warning in place that I'm going to tell you about coming up for now the temperature 12 degrees but as I said coming to down to 11 for all those fans, Mike. Okay, thanks a lot, Colette. You're welcome. Toronto Police have a new project coming to Chinatown. Project Blue Hog aims to crack down on crime in that area. So it begins by having officers that represent the community, who understand the culture and the language. Secondly, it means going into their homes, into their communities, into the um, malls, and providing uh, orientations and presentations, which make the whole reporting process user-friendly. It has to be user-friendly. It cannot be seen as a, as a sign of intimidation. It must be a relationship where they feel open, comfortable and confident about their relationship with their officers. It's an awareness that people are actually working together to make sure that the safety of the community is upheld. The 10-week project begins on Monday and will focus on crime prevention, theft from vehicles, shoplifting, panhandling, public intoxication and drugs. Police will have more patrols in the area and will be checking in with local businesses helping them prevent crime. They'll also be conducting workshops for seniors to raise awareness about telemarketing scams, how to prevent identity theft, and power of attorney, of attorney abuse. Now, these programs will be available in English, Cantonese, and Mandarin. Projects like Blue Hog have been happening in Chinatown for the past 10 years. Well, if your bills seem a little higher lately, you're not imagining it. Statistics Canada says inflation is up. The consumer price index increased 1.9% in March. Mortgage borrowing costs were up more than 8%. Car insurance as well, it was up more than 5%. But it's not all bad news for consumers. The price of internet services are down almost 10% compared to a year ago. And although gas prices are slightly higher than last month, they're still 4.4 cents lower than last year. Well, groceries are another area in which prices are going up. The cost of fruit jumped more than 8% in March from a year earlier. And vegetables jumped nearly 16%. Jacqueline Hansen has more on what's behind these spiraling costs. At this Toronto grocery store, Carmelo Papia is in charge of the produce section. He sees firsthand when trends like the latest celery juice craze increase demand and drive up costs. It's the highest I've ever paid. To be honest with you, we're talking well over $100 a case. Uh, what we're selling them for, we're not pretty much making any money. According to Statistics Canada, the cost of all vegetables and fruits except bananas are way up, and some shoppers are feeling it. I buy what I need for one day or two days, and we manage. The price of lettuce jumped more than any other vegetable. It's up 19% over the past year. But that's largely because of the E. coli outbreak that hit Romaine and caused the price of all lettuce to spike. We saw 
uh, a lot of uh, many of the prices go up in the leafy greens in general because as soon as one product gets affected by by a unforeseen event usually typically you, you see other products being affected uh, the same way so this professor factor, of food distribution factor, and policy course. says the recall effect should be short-lived but other factors could push overall prices even higher Produce prices are becoming more and more volatile due to climate change, due to energy costs that are fluctuating so much. So uh, this is the new normal for all of us. Plus, Canada imports billions of dollars worth of fruit and vegetables. When the Canadian dollar weakens, which it has over the past year, buying abroad is even more expensive, leaving shoppers with growing bills. It's having a huge impact, but it also means I'm trying to plan better so I'm not ending up throwing stuff out unnecessarily. There could be some relief from extreme price jumps in the coming months as the Canadian growing season kicks in and there's more produce on the shelves for shoppers to choose from. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. Friends, today our great province has sent a message to Canada and the world. Alberta is open for business. That kind of sounds familiar. Well, Alberta will soon have a new Conservative Premier. Jason Kenney was swept to power with a large majority. More on his decisive win and how it could affect politics right across Canada Coming up next. The weather update is brought to you by Train Extreme Conditions Testing. It's hard to stop a train, really hard. Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand.
So bill number one in that legislature session will be the Carbon Tax Repeal Act. Bill number two will be the Open for Business Act. We will also pass the first installment of the job creation tax cut in that first session of the legislature. Alberta is back in the blue. Jason Kenney and his United Conservative Party will form a majority government in the province after voters in yesterday's election turfed Premier Rachel Notley's NDP team. Kennedy is promising a new approach to rebuild Alberta's struggling economy and to fight anyone in Canada trying to stop him. Carolyn Dunn has the details from Calgary. The only thing bigger than Alberta Premier-designate Jason Kenney's pickup truck is his gloves-off plan for change. Albertans have decided that we will no longer passively accept the campaign of defamation against the industry that has helped to create one of the most prosperous and generous societies on earth. Kenny's acceptance speech was an invitation to some. If Quebecers and other provinces want to benefit from masses transfers developed by the hard work and resources of Albertans, then they must be partners with us. And a warning shot to others like environmental activists. Your days of pushing around Albertans with impunity just ended. Kenny is also promising to turn off the gasoline taps to BC if it continues to oppose and block pipelines. The federal government paid $4.5 billion last year to buy the Trans Mountain Pipeline and help push the project through, a deal that was contingent on a carbon tax in Alberta and capping carbon emissions. Kenny is going to scrap the provincial carbon tax and erase the NDP's climate plan. Ottawa still owns that pipeline. It's really important that across the country that we have an ambitious climate plan. We're implementing this plan in an affordable way. Um, and we look forward to continuing to do that with all provinces because we are all in this together. Except Kenny has shown no indication he's in it with Ottawa, making political hay on campaigning against the Trudeau Liberals. He's even vowed to join a legal battle with other Western premiers to try to kill the federal carbon tax. Rachel Notley used strong environmental policy and a charm offensive to try to rebrand Alberta's struggling energy industry. Jason Kenney's approach couldn't be more different. In some ways, that pickup truck of his is a metaphor. His message? Jump on in or get out of the way. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. The return of a provincial conservative government could rewrite the dynamics between Alberta and the federal government. Now to make sense of what Jason Kenney's win means to Trudeau's liberals, here's our senior parliamentary reporter, Julie Van Dusen. So, Julie, tell us about the bigger significance to Alberta turning blue. Well, I mean, Justin Trudeau had a phone conversation with Jason Kenney earlier today, and it was uh, probably, you know, to congratulate him and talk about uh, some of the key issues. But there is no doubt they are on a collision course, and we saw that uh, during the campaign with many of the issues that Jason Kenney brought up. Now, Jason Kenney knows Ottawa. He knows how it works. He was an MP here from 1997 on, and a cabinet minister in the Harper government. He, he knew Justin Trudeau uh, here in the, in the final years when Trudeau was an MP and, um, and Kenny was in cabinet. He knows how it works. He knows how to press all the buttons. And of course, he used Trudeau as a uh, punching bag, I guess he would say, during his campaign. So expect him to continue playing hardball. And some of those issues uh, involve energy, of course. He, he wants to scrap the carbon tax. That could be a problem for Trudeau, since that tax was a quid pro quo from uh, Rachel Notley over the whole approval of the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Uh, so Kenny says even if uh, Trudeau imposes a carbon tax on Alberta, uh, he'll take him to court over that. And he also wants to take him to court over uh, Bill C-69, which is a bill to uh, come up with a new system of, uh, of to approve and review energy projects. Uh, so they're on a collision course and also about equalization payments because Jason Kenney says Alberta gives too much. And he says, maybe I'll hold back on some of that until I get a pipeline. So take a listen to the prime minister who basically scoffed at that notion. Jason Kenney was part of the government under Stephen Harper that negotiated the current formula on equalization. Um, I think that's a question to ask him. If he was fine with the current equalization formula when he was in government, why is he choosing to play politics with it now? 
So, Mike, expect fireworks and expect Trudeau to push back. And he'll certainly line up Jason Kenney with all those premiers, uh, conservative premiers, who are opposing uh, his climate uh, plan. And, of course, uh, the big progressive conservative in the country, whose main rival, Andrew Scheer. And he'll tell voters, of course, you have a choice. Do you want uh, to vote for a party, as in the conservative party, that doesn't have a plan to uh, fight climate change? or? Uh, or me, and I have a plan. So that's what he's banking on, and we'll see what happens. Watch that dynamic unfold. Thank you, Julie. That's uh, Ju our senior parliamentary reporter, Julie Van Dusen, in Ottawa. The Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers wanted people in Alberta to vote with energy in mind, so they are welcoming Kenny's victory. With a renewed mandate uh, that uh, having all parties and the people of Alberta make the the election about energy issues I think positions getting uh, these energy issues resolved does put uh, the Canadians energy sector in uh, a stronger position cap is holding an energy symposium in Toronto this week Alberta's incoming premier has promised to work closely with energy producers he's also a supporter of pipelines and promised to reverse NDP policies that the industry felt made them less competitive Still to come on our newscast. With the federal government's carbon tax, you'll pay more for heating your home, for driving your kids to school, and for groceries. After the break, how much are these ads about the carbon tax from the Ford government costing Ontario taxpayers? What I do know is the federal government is spending millions no, of dollars. Much, how much, how much is your ad campaign? This is they a are spending question. millions. How much is your ad campaign? How much are you spending? I, I'm looking at what the federal government is doing, mailing out postcards, are, are you signing off on these ads without knowing the cost?
It's been six months since recreational cannabis was legalized in this country, but implementation may not be going exactly to plan. Municipalities are supposed to get a share of the tax money from pot sales, but many mayors say that is not happening. Hannah Thibodeau has the details. On the streets of Winnipeg, social workers say the legalization of recreational pot is taking much needed resources away from the ongoing meth crisis. The police are stretched for sure because they're dealing with the meth, but they're also needing to deal with the government's direction on making sure that the uh, illegal sale of cannabis is shut down. But many cities like Winnipeg aren't getting the cash promised by the federal and provincial governments and are forced to pay for things like extra police, training and bylaw enforcement with their own money. In pot shops like these, an excise tax is collected on sales. The federal government keeps 25 percent, giving 75 percent to the provinces, with the expectation that the provinces hand over 25 percent to the municipalities. Winnipeg estimates pot legalization will cost the city three and a half million dollars for 2018-2019. But the Manitoba government has refused to help, saying it isn't clear there will be any net revenue for the province. I mean, there, there are lessons to be learned from tobacco and from alcohol. We've seen uh, mostly provincial governments really cash in uh, for decades on, uh, on those two uh, substances. And we see, you know, history is going to repeat itself once again. Further west, Calgary has the highest concentration of pot shops in the country, with 24. The city says it'll cost more than $10 million over two years, but the province will only pony up $3.8 million. They claim, well, we don't know what the costs are, so we can't give up any of the excise tax to the cities because we don't know what our costs are. Well, here's the thing, I know what my costs are. They're really high. The Federation of Canadian Municipalities has raised the funding issue with a federal finance minister. It's up to the provinces at this point to, uh, to step up to what they committed to uh, during those negotiations. Municipalities say without more money, legalization of pot will have side effects, including increased property taxes. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. You can see it, the heat is really starting to, to build up now. And we now have flashover in that unit. Anybody inside there will not survive that fire. And we're only at three and a half minutes in. The fire trucks have not even arrived yet. Well, sprinklers may be a bit pricey, but they could save your life. Yeah. Fire officials held a side-by-side -side demonstration today, burning two rooms, one with sprinklers and one without. Now, you just saw the room without sprinklers. But here's the room with them installed. You see the fire catches, the system engages. Looks very different though from that first room. Now fire officials are hoping the demonstration shows that having an automatic fire sprinkler system can mean the difference between life and death. When we talk sprinklers, there's a number of myths out there. People believe that, you know, if I put sprinklers in my, my house, I'm gonna get uh, flooding happening. Uh, if I burn toast, the sprinkler's gonna go off. Uh, it's gonna leak, it's gonna, you know, and there's just a whole, uh, the cost alone uh, has people worried. Um, I would suggest that there's a number of things that you can do. If you're building a new home, we encourage everybody to go out and put sprinklers in. Um, it, it's, it's no more expensive than the granite countertop that you're putting into your kitchen. The sprinklers will save your lives. Even when you're not home, it's going to protect your house. Now, those sprinklers aren't mandated in the Ontario Building Code. Fire officials strongly suggest you invest in them. The PC government is ramping up its campaign against the federal carbon tax. First, there were stickers on gas pumps, now a series of radio ads. All this as it is fighting the tax in court this week. As Lisa Shing tells us, the opposition is calling it all a waste of taxpayers' money. With the federal government's carbon tax, you'll pay more for heating your home. Over the last few weeks, the progressive conservatives have been blasting their message across the province. Mandatory stickers on gas pumps, ministers and the premier making appearances. People of our province have to know how the federal government is gouging them. The federal carbon tax will drain resources. A carbon tax is... This is the latest tactic, a 30-second ad that debuted on radio and social media today, with TV ads rolling out sometime in mid-May. This will result in the average family paying $648 a year by 2022. 
We reduce gas prices. And if the government's goal is to get people talking, it seems to be working, at least with the opposition. How much are we going to pay for the Premier's massive ego trip? The NDP even introduced a private member's bill, first tabled by the PCs when they were in opposition. Voting against this bill would be the height of hypocrisy. That New That's because it would have put a stop to taxpayer-funded partisan advertising after the Liberals loosened rules and removed power from the Auditor General to veto government ads. The Auditor General told us she would have nixed the PC's new ad under the old rules. And we wonder if it's a, pub a good use of public dollars. As for how much public money went towards the ads, the Treasury Board president couldn't say. Uh, I haven't gone through line by line the budget. In its platform, the PCs budgeted $30 million towards fighting the carbon tax. A government source told CBC it spent well below that amount with both the ads and the legal challenge of the tax in court. Lisa Shang, CBC News, Toronto. As Lisa mentioned, the legal challenge the province is waging against the federal carbon tax played out in court for a third day. The crux of the argument is whether Ottawa is impinging on a province's rights. Today, the five-judge panel heard from interveners who wanted to argue their points, including Indigenous groups as well as provinces that support Ontario's position. Provinces are sovereign and autonomous within their realms of jurisdiction. They aren't subordinate to the federal government in any way. A province that fails to control GHG emissions effectively would further infringe or perhaps even extinguish the right of hunting caribou or fishing or other things. The court challenge wraps up tomorrow with lawyers for Ontario and the federal government responding to today's submissions. More than 360 teachers with the Peel District School Board have learned they'll no longer have permanent positions heading into the new school year. This comes even as Education Minister Lisa Thompson downplayed the cuts as an annual exercise by the board. The cuts were a central topic in the legislature today. The minister can't claim she's talking to teachers in good faith while the premier's Order. declaring war on educators. And she can't claim that no one is losing jobs as the layoff notices are flying out the door. This is not normal. Nope. We're going to stay focused. We're investing in education. As the premier said, we're investing $700 million alone this year. And again, not one teacher will involuntarily lose their job. We're investing $1.6 billion in attrition protection. 176 elementary and 193 secondary teachers were informed about the change in Peel Region yesterday. Fears of job losses and larger class sizes have dogged the Ford government since March when the province unveiled its education plan. Now, speaking to reporters in Markham yesterday, Ford told reporters that surplus notices are typical at this time of year. Ford has made no secret of his position on teachers' unions, saying they've declared war on the government. Before the ink was dry, when we won the election, the teachers' unions declared war on us. Yep. They told all yep. the teachers to save up three months of pay yep. because they're going to war. That's right. it, was, it was a day after. They, they couldn't help themselves. We don't want to go to war. We want the teachers in the classrooms. We want the kids in the classrooms learning. Needless to say, teachers all across the province are facing an uncertain future. Today, I spoke with one of the 193 secondary school teachers who received a layoff notice yesterday. Melissa, you got this letter yesterday. What did it say? Uh, it told me that I was surplus to my board, which meant that as of October 31st, 2019, that I no longer had a teaching position. How did that feel to get something like that? It did not feel good. Um, I had anticipated it because all of the other boards have been receiving their notice and I only have one year of permanent experience despite being eight years of experience uh, teaching in general. Uh, so I knew that it was coming. Um, I spent the weekend very, you know, I didn't feel good, very worried and you know, you're just waiting for something to happen and when it did eventually happen, I almost felt relieved that at least that first stage was finished and I really wanted to find out what happens next. Education Minister Lisa Thompson uh, said that this is a normal part of things that happen with the, the school boards this time of year. No permanent teachers will lose their position as a result of these sort of things. What do you make of those comments? Okay, so typically on an annual basis what will happen is some people will be access to school, which means that they still have a permanent position. Uh, they'll simply be transferred to another, uh, another building teaching different courses. 
Uh, but in this case, we have 300 people who have been access to board, surplus to board, and what that means is that there is nowhere for us in September. And you do extracurriculars at your school yes, and I involved do. with active with that. Yes, what I do. will the effect at your school be? with this loss of, of uh, a teacher's access to board? So at my particular school, uh, because my specialty and major passion is uh, at-risk youth, uh, I do run a program uh, at our school that kind of pulls in all of the, all the students who don't really usually want to be there. Uh, it's the students that, you know, aren't attending uh, or they're not doing as well in their classes as they could be or they've got home trouble or, you know, substance abuse and other business like that. Um, so I don't know who will be running that program next year. And I've been running it since I got there and I've been there for six years. You talked about this difficult weekend you had waiting for the other shoe to drop. It's, you have some sense of what's happening to you now. Do you have any hope or sense that you might be in a classroom in September? I have lots of hope, uh, but I have no sense. Um, I don't, I have no idea where I will be. Uh, if, if I'll be in an LTO or if I'll be doing daily supply or what exactly that looks like at this point. But I am hoping to be a permanent contract teacher again soon. Well, the fans are back in blue and white. Maple Leaf Square okay, cool. is filling up this evening as Toronto and Boston get set for game four right here on CBC. The Leafs with a chance to put a stranglehold on the Bruins. Kelly Kennedy's back with us right now. Let's hope the rain holds off for them tonight, although we can't hold it off indefinitely, though. No, we sure can't, Mike. Uh, here we are. You know, we've got this holiday weekend almost upon us. We've got a big warm-up coming tomorrow. And unfortunately, we've also got a couple of systems that are going to be moving through and quite a bit of moisture, especially with the second one. But even with some thunderstorms locally, we could see some heavy amounts of rain uh, even tomorrow afternoon. So let me walk you through everything that's going to be happening. We'll just start with a look at the current temperatures. 12 degrees right now. Hamilton cooler at 7. Back towards southwestern Ontario. Winds are coming in at 13 degrees. Also coming in is this warm front. So the moisture associated with it, see all these lightning strikes, lots of thunderstorms there. There's the potential for a rumble of thunder tonight, more so up into cottage country, and more so tomorrow afternoon when the cold front comes through. But what's starting to happen is we're seeing a little bit more of this filling in here. So some of these showers starting to stretch out. Over a couple of days, this rain is going to add up. So take Thursday, take Friday, then you're looking at 25 to 50 millimeters of rain and environment can Canada has issued a rainfall warning then. It is to the north of the city, but includes Barrie, Midland, those areas, back towards Grey Bruce, over towards Peterborough. If you're doing any traveling, even along portions of Lake Ontario towards Kingston, we are looking at a special weather statement. So some heavy rains there as well. Let's walk through this now. So taking you through this evening, you see how some rain showers trying to move in here into the downtown core, possible by 10, 11. So towards the end of the game, as they're getting out some showers and for Maple Leaf Square, could be a little little bit wet uh, a little bit later on through the game. The, the warm front goes through, mild air pushes in, our temperatures soar tomorrow, but it will be breezy, but that cold front has to come through too. Looks like tomorrow afternoon and evening, the greatest chance for seeing some of these thunderstorms. In between, we should be into a dry slot, and I want you to know about that because that may be some of the best weather tomorrow during the day before the rains get here later on into the afternoon. The next system, though, it's going to be moving in as we go into Friday, and especially early in the day Friday, we are looking at some heavy rains, and it's not over with then. Even into Saturday, we could be seeing some rainfall. So if we keep adding this up, going through into Saturday morning, we're starting to talk about things looking like 30 to, as I said, up to 50 millimeters up into cottage country. 19 though the high tomorrow enjoy it until the rain showers move in late day friday some wet conditions cooler air will be coming in behind that system too and it looks like the second half of the holiday weekend mike our better chances of getting some more dry weather and some sunshine and we'll have enough rain until then that's for sure thanks a lot Colette. you're welcome Une responsabilité historique. this is a big challenge and a historic responsibility of this generation France has a plan and a timeline to raise Notre Dame Cathedral from the ashes of Monday's fire as we get an overhead view of the destruction. We'll take you to Paris for more on that after the break.
Well, this is new video of the destruction caused by the fire that ravaged Notre Dame Cathedral. That gaping hole is where the famous spire once stood. Now, what you don't see in this video are the dozens of firefighters who are still working on that roof. Their job is to make it safe and to shore up what's unstable and to remove what is still at risk of falling. Now, a French official says firefighters' aggressive attack on the Notre Dame Infernal Inferno saved the historic cathedral from a chain reaction collapse. It's still not known, though, how stable the structure is, how long it'll take to fix it, or how much it will cost. But as René Filippone tells us from Paris, Easter worshippers who usually attend Notre Dame will have a place to pray. This is Saint-Sulpice, the second largest church in Paris. It'll serve as a refuge for Catholics who are struggling to come to terms with the destruction that's happened at the Notre Dame Cathedral. Easter services have also been moved here, and tonight there was a special mass dedicated to what happened two days ago at the cathedral. Also this evening, bells rang at churches right across Paris to mark the moment, two days ago when the fire started. Today, fire officials said the building was just minutes away from total destruction. There are still concerns about the stability of the structure, and inspections are ongoing. A billion dollars has been raised so far for the reconstruction from large and small donors. Today, the French Prime Minister said that the nation should rejoice beyond emotion and in the fact that a large number of French people want to participate. The government is promising transparency that all the money raised will go towards the rebuild and that they are sticking to the bold timeline of having the cathedral rebuilt in five years. Architects from around the world are being asked to compete for a chance to be a part of the rebuild. The Prime Minister also said the spire will be a part of the church in the future, but that the new design should adapt to new technology and challenges. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Paris. Well, it is the bane of commuters. Subway delays at the worst possible time. So just how does this happen? We have the anatomy of the worst subway system breakdown of the year. That's coming up after the break. Plus, it's almost game time. Leafs, Bruins, game four is just minutes away. We'll take you back to Maple Leaf Square to get you ready. Coming up.
Does this look familiar? Crammed subway platforms to get onto packed subway cars? Could be one of a number of chaotic commutes. This was actually, though, January 24th, a Thursday morning, the worst commuting day for the TTC this year. Now we've learned exactly what happened that morning. New data obtained by CBC Toronto reveals the full extent of the delays, showing how a series of failures and alarms set off a domino effect that reached nearly every part of the subway system. Here's Nick Boisvert to explain. On a really good morning, the TTC can run like clockwork. Trains arrive at the platform every two and a half minutes and move up to 30,000 people an hour. Obviously, not all mornings are like that. On this morning, it got really bad thanks to something that happened before most of us were even awake. The track sensor at Museum Station wasn't working properly, forcing the control center to slow down every train through the station. By 6 a.m., a train leaving Vaughan Metropolitan Center took an hour and a half to get to Union Station, twice as long as it's supposed to take. By 7, that same trip had ballooned to an unheard of 2 hours and 20 minutes. Because trains were getting bottlenecked north of Museum, hardly any could get to the other side of the line. The TTC was forced to hold trains on Line 2 as well to keep stations like Bloor Young from dangerous overcrowding. Two emergency alarms made things even worse at Bloor Young, the city's busiest junction. By 8.30, a trip from Finch to Union had also doubled from 30 minutes to almost an hour. By the time rush hour was over, there had been a staggering 28 separate incidents, including 14 mechanical problems and nine emergency alarms. It all added up to make for the worst morning commute in more than a year. We are just minutes from game time. I'm Greg Ross, live in Maple Leaf Square with some anxious Leaf fans. We'll get you set for game four right after the break. Go Leafs, go! Go Leafs, go! A wonderful night for a win. We're just minutes away from the puck drop. Game four, they're on the edge of their seats. They're barely moving. They're so excited. They're Toronto up two games to one in this series. We want to head back to our Greg Ross, if we can get our camera working. There's Greg. He's in the middle of the action there at Maple Leaf Square. Greg, you talked to some of the players today. What are they saying about uh, the importance of uh, heading into the game tonight? 
Well, Mike, they realize that this is an opportunity for them to take complete control of this series. And what they need to do is the exact opposite of what they did in game two. They have to come out and they have to follow up that great performance in grade three in game three with another great performance here in game four tonight. Here's what Austin Matthews had to say. I mean, I think we realize the opportunity that we have and, uh, you know, you want to take advantage of it. So, you know, we're at home again and uh, with the atmosphere and everything, it's obviously exciting to play in front of. So we want to make sure, uh, like we did in, in game three, that we come out ready to play that first 10 minutes. Uh, you know, we had a chance to get better yesterday. I think we did that, and it's important that we refocus. You know, we won game one, then we came out in game two. We didn't have a great start, so it's important that we know that and, uh, you, you know, we prepare accordingly. We weren't prepared enough to play game two. Their level of intensity, their level of jam, their level of getting on top of us was different. We didn't have enough pushback, and in the end, it cost us. And so we have to be prepared and understand the intensity of tonight's game. And these fans understand the intensity of tonight's game as well. And I'll tell you, there's always one in every crowd. Somebody that has to wear the opposing team's jersey. Yay! This is Carter, and he's here. A brave, you're very brave because you know there's nobody here that's on your side. Man, I, I cheer for the good teams. They don't know what the second round looks like because we take them out so often. So I'll let them have game two and three. We're going to take game four tonight. We're going to go back to ball. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to tell these fans who's going to win. Jump in the middle of these fans here. <laughs> game four! It's got game four! I just threw him to the wolves there, and uh, he seems to be handling it okay. These guys are really getting into it, but yes, that is one brave man right there. Uh, he came with these guys over here. Why would you allow a Bruins fan to come with you to the game tonight? Honestly, it's just really fun because I know Toronto's going to beat, beat them real bad and it's going to be really fun on the ride home. But you're not embarrassed to walk around with him all night tonight? Well, I didn't say that. I mean, we first got here and everyone starts booing him. I'm like, I don't know this guy. It is going to be a long night for you if those Bruins can't pull off a victory to even this series at two games apiece. Mike, it's the Leafs looking to take a 3-1 to series lead tonight at Scotiabank Arena. It should be a good one. Should be a great one indeed. Uh, thanks a lot there, Greg. You know, maybe to get even, they can take away his umbrella. Because yes. later in the evening after the game, uh, he might get soaked another way. Yeah, he's a brave soul, that guy. Yeah. And yes, everyone needs to be a little brave. It's some light showers that will likely be moving in towards the end of the game. So we'll be seeing that coming in around 10, 11 o'clock. Light showers, 6 degrees for our overnight temperature. Those showers will actually end in the overnight. We'll see some patchy fog possible tomorrow morning before that moves off. And then... A nice day tomorrow until the rain comes in in the afternoon. It's going to be breezy. It's going to be warm. But we'll see some heavier rains and some thunderstorms likely tomorrow afternoon. So we do have that window to get out and enjoy we, some I, nice I weather. I want though. you to th grab that dry slot in there and get out there. All right. Thanks a lot. That's our newscast for tonight. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 6. Have a great evening and go Leafs go.